To get on the Jedi Council, you have to be one of the best, wisest, and most powerful Jedi, right? Wrong. You remember the legendary Coleman Trevor? Yeah, all he does is get wiped out by Jango Fett in two shots. Then there's Evan Piel, who's just some Russian ripoff of Yoda. First, he gets captured by the Separatists. Not by Dooku, Ventress, or even Grievous. Just some super battle droids and droidekas are all it takes to capture this man. Then, after Obi-Wan and Anakin break him out of the Citadel, he gets killed by some random wolf-like creature. And before you say that these creatures are a special challenge or something, Ahsoka fought off the wolves with ease, and she was only a Padawan then. Pathetic. If Evan Piel hadn't gotten himself captured, then Echo wouldn't have died. That might have changed everything for Fives when he investigated Order 66. Who knows? Next, there's Jedi Master Yaddle. You might think she'd be a really powerful Jedi since she's part of Yoda's species, but she's not. Yoda must have taught Count Dooku the secret to killing his species back when Dooku was his Padawan because Count Dooku absolutely claps Yaddle in a duel and she dies uselessly. This next council member really makes me mad though. The Jedi are forbidden to have attachments, and yet Master Kiyadi Mundi has five wives. And it's not even a secret like Anakin and Padme's relationship. No, it was an accepted and heralded fact in the Jedi Order. What was his excuse? That the male population of his species was so low that he was required to help reproduction so his species wouldn't go extinct. He really used 100% of his big head to come up with that one. And besides, I think he just embodies a lot of what's wrong with the Jedi Order. And that's exactly why Mace Windu is one of the worst Jedi Council members, coming in at number 9 on my list. This is a controversial take, I know, but hear me out. Sure, Mace is great in a lot of ways. His purple lightsaber is iconic, and the fact that he's played by Samuel L. Jackson just makes him super fun to watch. He's actually one of the greatest Jedi, and that's his problem. Mace had a secret attachment, and that attachment was the Jedi Order and the Republic. He held these institutions so dear to his heart that he would do anything to uphold and defend their ideals. Mace was too focused on following the Jedi rules and the Republic regulations that he never fulfilled his true duties as Jedi, to preserve peace and follow the Force. Because of that, Mace was one of the driving factors to the collapse of the Republic. Mace believed in discipline and control. Anakin was the embodiment of everything that was against that. Because of Anakin's unique situation coming to the Jedi Order later on in life, and the prophecy that Anakin was the chosen one, Mace saw him as a liability. He thought, somewhat correctly, that Anakin's volatility and special relationship with the Chancellor would be dangerous to the greater good. The first big mistake he made was letting Anakin onto the Council, but not making him a master. What? Then, when Anakin confided in Mace about his revelation that Palpatine was a Sith, Mace didn't allow Anakin to come with the team of Jedi sent to arrest him because of Anakin's relationship with the Chancellor. Of course, knowing Anakin, he came anyway later on, and seeing Mace standing over Palpatine out of context gave Palpatine the perfect moment to convince Anakin to kill Mace and turn him to the dark side. If Anakin had been there from the start, he would have seen Palpatine kill all the other Jedi Masters, and Anakin and Mace probably would have captured Palps. Alright, but enough about Mace Windu. Can you imagine dying to a headbutt from Savage Opress? Just ask Jedi Master Adi Gallia. Oh, we want and Addy fight Maul and Savage on Florum, and Savage completely owned Addy Gallia. Just based off that, you're probably wondering why in the heck I would rank her above Mace Windu. The reason for that is that she was very outspoken about not wanting the Jedi to get involved in the Clone Wars. She was very reluctant to become a general, and hated being out on the battlefield causing death and destruction. She preferred peaceful solutions, such as negotiation like Obi-Wan did. Because she didn't like fighting, she didn't train for combat very often. That's why Savage killed her so easily. Despite that, she went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Grievous on multiple occasions and held her own. In seventh place on my list, I've got Shock T. The Jedi Master that has died more times than we can count. No, but seriously, the reason I've got Shaq T this far up on the list is because of her vital role in the Clone Wars. Shaq T was stationed on Kamino to oversee the training of Clone Cadets. She made sure that young clones were treated as human beings, not just droids being sent out to war. She was able to see unique traits in each and every clone, and she also believed in giving the clones second chances, contrary to the harsh system the bounty hunter trainers had in place. Because of that, she's a big reason why Domino Squad, which included the future art troopers Fives and Echo, were able to complete their cadet training. She was also a big part of protecting and defending Kamino against the Separatist invasion in an attempt to steal Jango Fett's DNA. The unique thing about Shock T, though, is how many different ways she's died. In two deleted scenes, she's killed by Grievous, but the scene that I think where she she really died though is when she is meditating in the Jedi Temple and Anakin comes up from behind and stabs her. In the Clone Wars, Yoda had a vision of Order 66 and he briefly sees Shock T being stabbed from behind by a blue lightsaber in the same way that Anakin stabbed her. This makes me think that this is how she died in canon. One of the dumber Jedi Council member deaths, but definitely not the worst. Next and number 6 on my list, I've got Jedi Master Depa Balaba. You're probably wondering who in the world I'm talking about. Master Balaba has essentially no appearances in the Clone Wars and so we only briefly see her sitting in on council meetings in the movies. But there's one thing she did that was extremely important. She was the master to Kanan Jarrus, who would eventually go on to be Ezra's master in Star Wars Rebels. In the Bad Batch, we get to see Depa heroically go down in Order 66, protecting Kanan from the clones, which allowed him to escape and go on to be the important character he is. That's why I ranked her so high, because without her, Kanan wouldn't have been able to do what he did in Rebels. Now, these next Jedi are the ones that actually deserve to be on the Council. These are some of the best Jedi of all time. At number 5, I've got Kit Fisto. Kit Fisto was a great Jedi. He was considered to be one of the best duelists in the entire Jedi Order. And we see that on display with his unique fighting style when he dueled General Grievous. 
He fought General Grievous on multiple occasions, and one time he even cut Grievous' legs off. Kit Fisto was also a critical part of the underwater war on Moncala in the Clone Wars Season 4. Since Kit's species had the ability to breathe underwater, he was one of the logical choices to help Anakin and Ahsoka with defeating the Separatists. In Attack of the Clones, he was one of the few Jedi to survive the Geonosian Arena, and he took down a lot of battle droids. He's also part of the team that was supposed to arrest Chancellor Palpatine, and he lasts longer than the other two Jedi that Sidious took out. I don't like this scene because of how the Jedi Master dies so easily. Some people attribute it to Palpatine's forced scream, stunning them, but clearly Kit Fisto wasn't stunned as he was able to put up a few swings and parries. But maybe Sidious's influence impaired his attacking ability. I don't know. Anyway, in fourth place, I've got Master Plo Koon. He's special for a lot of reasons, aside from the fact that he looks super cool. He's the one who finds Ahsoka as a child in Tales of the Jedi. Once he finds out she's force sensitive, he brings her to the Jedi Order. So we have Plo Koon to thank for the entire Ahsoka series, not to mention everything else she did in the Clone Wars show. Because of this, Ahsoka and Plo Koon have a special connection, and they team up together on multiple occasions later on. Plo Koon is awesome because he commands the Wolf Pack, his clone battalion led by Commander Wolf, who is one of the most iconic clone troopers. It's clear through what he says and in his actions that Plo Koon loves the clones under his command. We're just clones, sir. We're meant to be expendable. Not to me. I value your life more than finding that weapon. What makes Plo Koon such a great Jedi is that he was truly compassionate, and unlike many other Jedi, he is actually concerned with the well-being of all the life around him, be that clones or civilians, regardless of their importance. He loved the clones in the wolf pack, and they loved him in return, painting his face on the side of the battalion's gunships. That's what makes his death at Order 66 so much more sad. In Revenge of the Sith, you could almost see the shock in his face through his mask as he realized his beloved clones are gunning him down. He'd never know that they were doing it against their will. Moving on, at number 3 we've got Grandmaster Yoda. Yoda is the oldest member of the Jedi Council. By the time of the Clone Wars, Yoda was 800 years old, and that is his problem. As leader and head of the Jedi Council, Yoda should have done more to put an end to the Clone Wars. As Dooku said, Yoda was complacent. When key information came to him, he didn't act on it. For instance, after the death of Fives and the revelation that the Clone Army came from the Separatists, he basically just shrugs his shoulders and says, well I hope this doesn't end badly. I get that that's something that's hard to act on. But Yoda could have tried to investigate further into what Fives had discovered, and maybe they could have had more of the clone's inhibitor chips removed. Yoda also led the Order in some bad direction. People like Mace Windu and Kiati Mundi, who are strict with the rules and the old ways of the Order, didn't come out of nowhere. They were bred and nurtured in an environment that Yoda created. To Yoda, people like them were ideal Jedi, and that left no room for change or introspection as to whether or not the Jedi could possibly be wrong sometime. Because of his obsession with the old ways, he gives Anakin terrible advice. In Revenge of the Sith, Anakin had visions of Padme's death and the bad things that were coming. Anakin smartly confides in Yoda, since Yoda is the oldest and supposedly wisest Jedi. When Anakin tells him his dreams, Yoda flatly responds that Anakin must let go of everything he fears to lose. Yeah, easier said than done, Yoda. Clearly Yoda had no grasp over what emotions Anakin was feeling, and he didn't want to bother spending more time helping the literal chosen one work through his issues. But Yoda's biggest mistake was not realizing that Chancellor Palpatine was Darth Sidious sooner. I get it, Sidious had great power too, so he was supposed to be able to mask his identity, but at some point, as old, wise, and as powerful as Yoda's supposed to be, you would think he might at least be suspicious. He literally had a personal encounter with Sidious at the end of the Clone Wars Season 6, but nothing changed. Yoda spends tons of time in meditation, having visions and premonitions of the future, including Order 66 and the Fall of the Jedi, but he never caught on to Sidious. He just keeps complaining that the dark side of the Force is clouding everything. Maybe Sidious was just working, especially hard to mess with Master Yoda's mind in order to then mess with the rest of the Jedi Order, since Yoda was the head of the Council. After that encounter with Sidious, Mace Windu brings up an important point, that even a master as powerful as Yoda is still susceptible to the dark side. I think that that line is in there for a reason. Yoda also personally visits Palpatine one-on-one -on -one in the Chancellor's office. He either failed to notice or didn't care that Palpatine had many Sith artifacts in his office, which should have at least been a small red flag. In the off chance other Jedi wouldn't recognize those pieces as Sith, Yoda should have, being the oldest and most experienced. Finally, Yoda's decision to go into exile rather than help the Rebellion or try to do something productive is just stupid. It's like Yoda finally realized how badly he'd messed up and was so depressed that he decided he just needed to exile himself. One might argue that he was planning to wait for Luke to come so Yoda could train him, but I'm not going to give Yoda that much credit. The main good thing I have to say about Yoda is he is definitely instrumental in bringing balance to the Force. Because he trained Luke, Luke is ready to take on Vader at Cloud City. Even though he loses and nearly dies there, surviving this experience helps him then turn Vader back to the light side and finally defeat Darth Sidious for good, fulfilling Vader's destiny as the Chosen One. The only reason I'm not ranking Yoda lower on this list is probably because I'd get flamed for doing so. Okay, now this is where it gets interesting. I know you guys are going to hate this one. 
but at number two, I've got Anakin Skywalker. Yes, he was on the council at one point. Remember this hilarious scene from Revenge of the Sith? Anakin is a great council member for this simple reason. He destroyed the Jedi Order. I know what you're thinking. How is that a good thing? In some sense, you'd be right, but let me explain. As I've already said, the Jedi Order had existed for millennia as the primary group of Force users. At its core, the Jedi Order is a good institution. The Jedi are supposed to be peacekeepers. But under the long leadership of Master Yoda and Jedi like Master Windu, the Council and the rest of the Order had completely lost its way. While there were still good Jedi in the Order, like Plo Koon and Depa Balaba, the Jedi Order had corrupted itself to the point that the Council needed a complete overhaul. And well, Anakin did that, even if his method was a little unorthodox. After Sidious set Order 66 into motion, Anakin wiped out the remaining Jedi at the Temple. Because of this, Anakin ended up bringing the Force closer to being balanced than it had ever been in millennia, and he would finally accomplish it by killing the Emperor on the Death Star. Aside from all that, when Anakin was still a good man, he was a good Council member because he brought a different perspective. He was by far the youngest Council member, and as I said, he was completely different from guys like Yoda and Windu, in that he wasn't as disciplined and allowed his emotions to control him more. In theory, this brings a different perspective to the table to an ordinarily unanimous group. At the very least, he could add different opinions to the Council's decisions. Of course, the Council stupidly tries to turn Anakin on Palpatine, which backfires big time, so we never really get to see what Anakin could have done on the Council, but because of who he is, he's just intrinsically better than the other Council members, let's be honest. Except for one. The best Jedi of all is Obi-Wan Kenobi. Obi-Wan was the perfect balance between the discipline and rule following of Mace Windu and the skill and brashness of Anakin. Obi-Wan is the archetype of the perfect Jedi. Obi-Wan is wise beyond his years. This is because his master, Qui-Gon, allowed Obi-Wan to see a different perspective. Obi-Wan learned from Qui-Gon that good and evil isn't a black and white issue, rather it's a clouded and convoluted thing. Because he understood this, Obi-Wan always sought the most peaceful solution first, a solution that would benefit everyone. He only resorted to combat when he was attacked, or when it was his only choice. That doesn't mean Obi-Wan avoided combat though, far from it. He's arguably the best duelist in the Jedi Order. He's an offensive specialist like Dooku, but still very powerful on the offensive. He took down Darth Maul not once, but twice. He fought General Grievous more times than anyone, and eventually Obi-Wan was able to kill him on Utapal. So uncivilized. He's also beat Anakin at Anakin's Prime. Later in the Kenobi show, Obi-Wan defeats Darth Vader yet again. After the fall of the Jedi Order, in stark contrast to Yoda, Obi-Wan takes an active role in making sure Luke is protected. And that is the most important thing about Obi-Wan. He never gave up. He was persistent in getting the job done the right way. In the Clone Wars, despite all of the amazing and impossible feats he accomplished, he remained humble, modest, and true to himself through all of it. 